Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Brock Wally Program. My name is Brock Wally. I'm your fearless host. For a change of pace, I'm going to play the recording, and it isn't the greatest recording, so I do apologize ahead of time. I'm going to play for you a recording of a panel that I was on. The panel consisted of me, which one of these things don't belong in this panel, a medical doctor and a scientist, and we just sort of uh, fielded tough, difficult questions specifically that had to do with the Judeo-Christian worldview. Here you go. First question um, is, what's the big difference between Catholic and Christian? So, like, my whole family is Roman Catholic. My, my father is, like, the only Protestant out of the whole group. And he kind of, like, left, and it was this kind of, I wouldn't say a schism, but it was a bit of a thing. There's a couple things that I think... Uh, Protestants kind of freak out about. And I think one of them is that the veneration of the saints. So, like, saints and Mary are kind of a big deal in the Catholic Church. And, you know, and like, oh, man, they're praying to Mary. Oh, man, they just prayed to St. Joseph. What the heck? You know, you can only pray to God. What's going on here? And, you know, at first glance, it really does seem that way. And you're like, well, that's not cool. But if you ask a Catholic, they're like, well, what's going on? Most of them will tell you, well, what I'm doing is I'm asking them to pray for me. You know, just like, hey, mom, would you pray for me? You know, I'm having a tough time. So you have no problem asking your mom to pray for you. And so they would say, why should I have a problem asking, you know, Jesus' own father, Joseph, to pray for me? Like, if he's still alive, he's just in heaven. You know, and so I, when you hear that, you're like, oh, okay, that sounds pretty reasonable. But, you know, <laughs> it does kind of run the risk of almost like maybe being a little bit too extreme. But that's what they're doing. They're, they're, it's, they're, it's not worship. It's veneration. They're holding up to a higher standard. So it's kind of a, a thing. That's a cool story, by the way. I grew up evangelical, and I grew up in a church that did not like Catholics. So here's an interesting thing. I, I was like the rebel because at 18, all of a sudden, I started reading Catholic literature and church history. By the way, if you take it upon yourself to just do a little digging into your faith, but I, I would encourage you all to do that, you're very, very quickly going to run into Catholicism, right? As soon as we, you know, Luther broke, we, we touched down and started doing our own thing. But here's what's interesting. When I was a little older than you, I, I was traveling through Europe with a friend of mine. And over there, there's these amazing churches, hundreds and hundreds of years old, nothing like it here. The architecture takes your breath away. If you can even imagine, you know, I was in like John Knox's church. Anyway, I'm sitting in this Catholic church and this old, really weathered woman comes up to the saint, does a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't understand, lights this candle, and I'm just sitting taking this all in as an evangelical who's supposed to have all this judgment. But I'm in this beautiful place, and this woman's so humble, and she prays to the saint. And I think about this uh, from a different perspective. As, and I'm still an evangelical Christian. I do not, I think, Catholicism flourish with legalism more than I'd like, and so on and so forth. But I look at this, and if you think of Christians through the tapestry of time, that somehow there would be a connection between this woman on some visceral level is beautiful. Now, the theology of all that is a whole other animal. But I, I, don't, I find that you know, Christ can definitely touch lives through, through Catholic backgrounds. It's all about the heart. Don't we believe that? It's all about the heart. Um, so if the heart is right with Christ in, in, the, in the tent of Catholicism, I've, I've met Christians. Yeah. So Catholics... Point blank question. Catholics believe that we go to heaven because of what Jesus did on the cross. 100%. 100%. Absolutely. So at the core of our faith, Catholics are lining up. And then they do some other things that aren't quite like how we do it, but at the core of how do you get right with God, Catholics and us line up. Yeah, absolutely. All right, our next question. How do I come back to the faith? You pretend. (laughs) Sounds bad. But it's the truth. So, like, whenever you do anything, right, you, you, feel, you don't feel a certain way. I don't feel happy. I'm not happy. But I want to be happy. Well, what do you do? You pretend to be happy. You know, I'm not really happy to see Brock here tonight. I'm not <laughs> Brock's here. I'm not happy. But I don't let him show that. I, a lot of people feeling that I way. Pretend, I pretend, hey, good to see you, Brock. I'm so glad you're here. You know? You know, and honestly, you, you start to act a certain way. And it can become very real over time. I think oftentimes, you know, I look at little kids and they pretend to be grown-ups. And that's what they're going to become. As they play and they behave, they act like little grown-ups and assume that's what they become. And I think with a Christian, um, especially when you when you fall away 
you know, you're like, wow, I'm not a Christian. I'm not acting like a Christian. Well, maybe I should just pretend to be one. Well, what does that look like? Well, I should, what do Christians do? Uh, well, Christians pray. Well, I, maybe I should start praying. All right, I'll start praying because that's what Christians do, and I'll pretend to be one, and I'll pray. Christians read their Bible. Okay, well, I'll pretend to be a Christian, and I'll pretend to read, I'll read my Bible. You know, and you, do, you go through these motions, uh, and it's, a, it's the beginning, right? It's the start. You have to, I mean, it's not all of a sudden, like, you're going to drift away from God, and suddenly, like, one day, you're like, oh, I love God again. It, that, that's not how it works, right? You have to, you have to kind of begin a process of going back. And in the beginning, it's incredibly shallow and not real, because if you don't feel like you're a Christian, you might not be. And you have to begin a process of becoming one and coming back to God. And I feel like oftentimes that's a shallow way, but it's how it begins. I mean, heck, half of us you know, became Christians because we didn't want to go to hell. Well, that's a really shallow reason to love God, but it works. It's the first step, you know, and it's, you know, that's, that's how I feel. And real quick, I actually, I left the faith for a number of years, mentally at least. Um, and for me, it was a mental departure. I was, I, com- I, I was confronted with some questions in my later years, uh, you know, early 20s. And uh, I had a real insatiable appetite for the intellect, quite frankly, through that time. And I think I misprioritized that. We are mind, body, soul, by the way, as believers, not just mind. And um, actually, interestingly enough... The book he's holding in his hand, somebody gave me that, and I read it and uh, started my way back. So I know exactly what that feels like. And the, the mind played tricks on me, and I was reading all these philosophers and these people that were lauded by my professors and so on and so forth. Some of them are pretty good snake oil salesmen, actually. They make a pretty, pretty good case against the faith. But there's hopelessness, and there's darkness, and none of those people had the answers. They weren't filled with joy. Um, and the more I looked at that, and then looked at the, at the people who, who had faith, I, I, I found myself drifting back, and thank God I did. And then also there was just wonderful people to answer my questions, which, by the way, is what's so cool about something like this. Because I guarantee you, if you haven't dealt with doubt, you will. You 100% will. That sounds like a whole load of hypocrisy, right? Like, fake it till you make it. Is that really... How is that genuine? Here's the thing. We try to be so genuine. We're fake. Like, we try to be so... How many people are like, I'm going to be so original? And they're not. They're just a copy of other people who are trying to be original. Here's the, you got to be yourself, right? Just be true to who you are, which is really hard. That's, like, totally, like, a cliche and, like, you know, patronizing statement. But, like, here's the thing. Like, I, I'm supposed to be like Jesus Christ. That's what I'm called to be like. But he's the son of God. He's a, he's a perfect being of unimaginable power and intelligence. And I'm supposed to be like that? That's a joke. There's no way a person like me could be like that. But yet, in the Bible, time and time again, that's what he's telling me to be. So, how do you do that? Well, you act like him as best you can. So, when I was a little boy, I acted like my father. Now, there's no way I could be my father. My father was a strapping five foot eight man. But at the time, he seemed like this colossus. <laughs> And so I acted like my father. I tried to be like my dad. And sure enough, I find myself acting towards my kids just like my dad did. I'm right in his shoes. And, and that's how we're supposed to be with Christ. And if you feel yourself drifting away, he's asking you to be like him, act like him. And if you don't feel like that, how many of you guys feel like going to school? None. How many of you guys go to school anyway? Well, you're not being authentic. Be authentic to your feelings. Skip school. <laughs> Wait. Yes. 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 This is you, good see, stuff. you see how this is good? Be Pearls of wisdom. This is a bad idea, right? So sometimes we have to be things we don't necessarily think we should be or want to be. And being like Christ is a really hard thing to be. And so I feel like, you know, oh, I'm being fake. Well, you know what? If you're being fake and acting like Christ, that's a good start. You know, if you're being fake and if you're trying to be someone you shouldn't be, that's different. Like, so there's pretense, right? Like, if I try to act like someone important and someone better than myself, well, that's bad. That's not the way we should pretend. But if I pretend to be like Christ, well, Christ never pretended to be important. He was a servant to others. He helped. He put others before himself. He died for his friends. He died for his enemies. That's someone we can pretend to be like. And, I mean... If you don't feel like you want to be that, well, okay, I, I get it. You're kind of faking it, but I'm, I'm still faking it. I'm not Christ. And 
it's going to be a long time until I'm even close to him. You know, so I think I'm a little fake. I'm sorry. You know. I like the I like the childhood analogy of Matt's bringing because I have this one year old baby who's now just constant babble, 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 babble. And he looks at me as though he's speaking these profundities to me, like, I just discovered, you know, the greatest thing. It's babble. <laughs> and uh, a, a year from now, he's going to start talking, right? Monkey see, monkey do is actually what we all do. Um, I know, a, I'm a musician. How, half the musicians I know learn to play the guitar because they were watching other people play the guitar on YouTube. So this whole, like, you've got to be super authentic. You've got to play the G chord like everybody else. You've got to play the D chord like everybody else. Authenticity, ironically enough, comes in Christ. Yeah, I'm not saying don't, like, pretend to be a Christian and not be. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not going to say come in here, act like, I got your Bible, you got my Bible, you know, and then, then go home and be a complete jerk. That's not what I'm saying. But, like, you, I can read this Bible and, like, I don't want to read my Bible. Half the time I read the Bible, I'm like, I would so much rather be doing, like, 15 other things right now. But it's something you have to fight through. We have two scientists that are available tonight, and this question is, it is awesome. It's awesome that we have this question. I don't plan this to this degree. So God is definitely at work. We have like some questions that lined up with the people that came. The Catholic question didn't realize Steve grew up as a Catholic, so some coolness already happened. But this question is, what if my teachers are right about evolution? All right. Um, so, okay, what if my teachers are right about evolution? Well, if they're right, well, then it doesn't matter, right? Because you're going to be compost when you die. And nothing you do matters, and so what's the point of all this? It's a joke. So that's, that's one thing. Well, fortunately, I don't subscribe to that, so let's talk about what I think. Um, so I like going back and seeing what is, how, does science, how did science view our world in the first place. So I'm going to kind of leave evolution out just for a second and go cosmology, like the beginning of the universe. For a long time, since Aristotle, the universe was eternal. It's always existed. It's been a forever being. You know, and so a lot of scientists, especially ones that didn't believe in God, were totally happy with this concept that it always existed. Um, and then uh, a guy named Hubble, Edwin Hubble, uh, and some other scientists discovered that, wow, all the galaxies are moving away from us, and they're moving away very, very quickly. And if we can triangulate all their motions, we can figure out that, oh, they all came from one point. Well, isn't that weird? The universe is expanding from one beginning point. And they did a little bit more math, and they go, wow, it looks like it may have all started one spot at one time in this, and they kind of coined the phrase the Big Bang wouldn't that be interesting and so all of a sudden the universe now has a beginning which totally freaked out all the cosmologists they had a heart attack because now the universe has a beginning that lines up really really well with Christianity and that was not all that cool so they went around they tried to find ways to make it so the universe wasn't expanding it turns out that's not the case so then they said oh okay okay the universe is expanding we get it but over time, it will slow down, it will collapse in the big crunch, and then it will expand again in another big bang, and the universe is eternal. It's eternal. It's going to do this. It does this over and over. The big bang, it slows down. The big crunch, over and over again, the universe is eternal. And so everyone's like, yay, we don't need God anymore. And then they realize, oh, crud, it's not slowing down. It's speeding up. So they realize the big crunch is not possible. It's not going to happen. So that really freaked them out. So that was the end of that idea. And so then, uh, probably in the 70s and 80s, the idea is like, you know what? I bet you there's just lots of universes, and we're just one universe in many. And so this is no big deal. And so they, again, try to find another way to explain away God, which I found very interesting. But when it comes to evolution, it, it really comes down to this. Um, you have non-life, right? How many guys in biology? Anyone take bi biology? You guys remember Francisco Reddy? Remember Francisco Reddy? What did he, he did uh, the maggots and the meat and the cheese cloth. Remember that? He, a long time ago, they thought that life came from non-life. You know, a, 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 a pond would suddenly fill with water one day and frogs would start hopping around. Like, oh, the stones become frogs and dust becomes flies and gnats and this is how life begins. And, and they called it spontaneous generation, right? And Francesco Reddy, who loved, if you read about this dude, he was a little weird. He loved looking at rotting dead things, and he loved to draw rotting dead things in, in boxes. It was creepy. And he was, so <laughs> he was so obsessed with rotting dead things, he's like, you know, I watched this fly land on this rotting dead thing and lay its eggs and fly away, and then I kept watching those eggs hatch into maggots. It was awesome. And everyone else is like, Francisco, you got to get out, man. This is crazy. And um, Francesco already proved that life comes from life. And he, they call it, uh, what's the word in the Latin? I forget. Uh, was it uh, omne, omne vivum ex vivo or something like that? I don't remember. 
anymore. Because I'm laughing anymore. And anyway, life comes from life is basically what they prove. And so everyone was happy with that up until the idea that we need life to come from non-life because if there's no God, life has to originate from somewhere. So now we have what's called abiogenesis. Anyone heard about abiogenesis as a term you guys have heard maybe in biology? Yeah? Oh, good. Okay, so at least they're teaching you something. Abiogenesis is life from non-life. This is impossible. <laughs> it's a total joke. Um, they have been, tr- I mean, they're like, oh, look, I can make, I can make benzene in outer space. Like, that's great. That's a, you know, it's a, a carbon ring, right? We get these ideas. We can have these aromatic carbon rings. Yeah, I got aromatic carbon rings. We got organic molecules. And that sounds really lifelike. But it's not, it's not, it's no more, it's nothing, it's not life at all. They're so far away from life, it's not even funny. Um, there's so much to talk about. Our world is so, especially back then, when it was first being created, as, long, as far as they think it existed as, UV light, intense heat, I mean, there's no way uh, uh, an, amino, an amino acid could have formed a long polypeptide chain. It would have broken apart. It's in my, And the, the idea that a polypeptide chain would then form some kind of uh, self-replicating mechanism to duplicate itself over and over again and then be useful is insane. I mean, you guys saw ATP. You guys have read about, you've seen like ATP synthase. I mean, in biology, you know the mitochondria, right? That thing that looks like a big screwing machine. I mean, that says it's not a wrong phrase. But it's this big thing that rotates over and over and over again. It makes ATP. The idea that that just sprung into existence through, it's, it's nuts. It's completely insane. The, you, you'll hear your science teacher talk about life from non-life and that, oh, organic compounds came together somehow in clay or deep sulfur vents in the ocean. or They'll make up whatever story. There's not a lick of evidence. There's not one experimental procedure even showing how it's possible. It's impossible. It can't happen. The next one is, what should a Christian do when someone's trying to I have this happen to me a lot. <laughs> I used to be, I used to work in television and I used to work in radio before I took this job. And I had a lot of people defaming my character. Um, but on a serious question, this is huge. And actually I have really firm opinions on this. So back in the day, when somebody would slander, it's called slander, and if you write it down, it's called libel. If somebody would do that to another man or woman, sometimes... At dusk, they would, they would duel it out, and some dude would die as a result of this. That's how important a man's name is. And it's my opinion that that should have never changed, not necessarily the dueling. No not necessarily the dueling. <laughs> Although, you know, maybe if you get me at a point of candor, not necessarily the dueling. Maybe a good fight, but not, 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 nonetheless, a man's name is, is important. And this is, a, this is a, you can look at this both ways, to live a, a life of character. Um, and then somebody, especially in the day of internet and so on and so forth, you know, you guys live in a time that I didn't have to go to school in where somebody can get online and just go straight sports jerk on your name. And that has to be unbelievably hard to deal with. Uh, I think the best way to do it, by the way, is to live a virtuous life. Because at the end of the day, and this ties into what Steve just answered, when people are going through, if people have no faith and they declare no faith, but when, when life is really, really difficult, they're going to come to a person of faith. I found this to be true. Even your family members, they're going to know you have hope, they're going to know you have light. And I think if you live a virtuous life, I mean, they defamed Christ over and over and over and over again, they defamed Christ. So uh, I think this is baked into the cake of Christianity. I think we have to learn as Christians to carry the cross of of defamation, but it really happens to bottom my disposition, as you can tell. Um, And we take it way too lightly today, by the way, in my opinion. Do not slander your friends. Do not make stuff up about them. That, that's, that's not a small thing. That's a big thing. That's a big problem. Yeah. What is the difference between the Old Testament and the Torah? It's the same thing. Right, right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The first, the first five. The, the Torah... Well, that, that's the Pentateuch is the first five. Yeah, and then the entire Old Testament. It's the Torah, right? No, it's the Tanakh. Ah, oh, okay. Six in yeah. one, half dozen in the other. <laughs> that's a All right. That sounds rather Klingon to me. Um, <laughs> do you feel religions should have a dialogue with one another? Sure. If religions should have dialogue with one another? Well, so the easy answer to that is yes. Um, you should have a dialogue. Yeah, I mean, you 
want to come to common ground, common understanding, um, you still want to not to not to give up on your convictions. It's not that you need to be um, constantly warring with people. I think yeah, that there, there should be dialogue to create with these common understandings so that we can live um, on this earth um, and uh, hopefully you do it peacefully. I think that's sort of the goal. So, so yeah. So. Cool. Where in the Bible can someone find help for depression, for anger, frustration, uh, grudging, self loathing? I'll tell you what, I'm a big fan of, uh, a huge fan of, and I was not a fan of this my whole life. I'm a fan of the Beatitudes. I'm a big fan of the Beatitudes. This is the pinnacle teaching of Jesus Christ. Think of it as like, if you watch a good movie, right at that point when they're driving home, this is the point. The Beatitudes. And when you read them, you're like, who wants this stuff? You know what I mean? Blessed are the down, try the weak, the blah, 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 blah. But there is power in that, and you, you find the life of Christ in the Beatitudes. The other thing I would tell you is the fruits of the Spirit are another thing to constantly be rolling around in your head. Uh, depression are pretty much the opposite uh, of the fruits of the Spirit. And, and if you find that the fruits of the Spirit are not in your life, I like what Matt said. Think about how you can bring them into your life. You might have a person that's very peaceful. You might have a person that's very gentle. I have friends that are just incredibly gentle. I am not that person. My wife is that person. Being around her, I become more gentle. So on and so forth. I think uh, the Beatitudes, uh, the other thing I would say is every single day, read a song. I mean, these people, David, David, I like David because he's a songwriter. He's writing about great joys, great laments. Uh, read a psalm every day. Read a psalm every day, read a proverb every day. Wisdom, understanding. Billy Graham did that, by the way, so that's pretty good. What evidence do we have of Bible times? So the legitimacy of our biblical, of this, like, how do we know that this is, like, You ready for this? Legit. We have lots of Uh, gobs. Tons. Um, I mean, the entire, so, like, Jerusalem, Palestine, the Levant, it is just littered, littered with the Bible. I mean... There's so much you could talk about. I mean, so if you're like, well, I want to see where Peter was buried. Well, Peter was executed upside down on a cross and probably thrown outside the city, right? You're not going to find his tomb. Well, I want to see where Paul was buried. We had his head chopped off and he was thrown. How about Matthew? No, speared to death in Ethiopia. You're not going to find the disciples. That's not who you're not going to find these guys. They died in India. They died in Assyria. Really bad ways, all of them. Um, except for John, who's died of old age. But anyway. Here's the thing. Like, let me give you an example. There is a city called uh, Lachish, and Lachish is a really, sounds like a nice cheesy uh, egg product. But anyway, Lachish was this really cool, really cool city, and they were well known for their charioteers. It says so in the Bible, but we also know from other sources as well. And the Assyrians came out of the north and sacked the city, and they attacked Lachish so fast they uh, annihilated them. And there's a picture in Assyria in one of their capital cities, and I, I wish I could remember which one it was, and on the, front, on the wall of uh, one of their uh, buildings is the sacking of the city of Lachish. And you can see the men of Lachish throwing their chariots off the walls onto the Assyrian attackers because they were never able to get their chariots out to fight. They were beaten to the punch by the Assyrians. So we see things line up where we know Lachish, according to the Bible, had famous charioteers, and we also see an Assyrian battle fresco, or whatever you call it, motif, bas relief, saying, hey, you know, look at these idiots throwing their chariots off the wall. You know, and so we see things like this time and time again where there's just gobs of evidence. Now, people say, well, where's King David? Well, King David was a long time ago, but we are finding evidence of his reign even now. Um, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. Like, for example, a lot of times, like, for example, let's take the Bible, for example. Um, who wrote who wrote the Odyssey? Anyone know who wrote the Odyssey? Or the oh, Iliad? Homer. Who wrote the Iliad? Homer, Homer yeah. No, he recorded it. Well, okay. <laughs> but but they don't, you don't even know that. Actually, there's no evidence of Homer ever. None. Not one iota of Homer. We know his name only because people repeat it all the time. There is no evidence of him. There's no original manuscript. There's not even second, third, fourth. We have nothing. Even, even Shakespeare. 
We don't even know who that guy was. We have no original manuscripts of Shakespeare, and he's not even that old. The Bible, we have gobs and gobs of, or not, I would say, original. But, I mean, we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they had, we found the entire book of Isaiah, it's 70, 700 years old, and it's exactly the same as my Bibles, without any, any difference, none. And it's 700 years old, sitting in a, in a cave, hidden from, you know, whoever was taking Bibles at that time. It is a lot. I mean, you what, know who you want to talk to? Nate what, Hacker. What's the importance of that? Nate Hacker. 700 years old hasn't changed. Why is that, why is that significant or why would you trust it? Well, well, here's the thing. I mean, like, it, this is supposed to be God's word, right? If it changes, well, then why would a God allow his word to change? Like, that doesn't sound like a very powerful God. If it allows our words, his words, to constantly be in flux and changing all the time. So when I find that, you know, these texts are the same 700 years later as they are now, that, that says to me that this is a true thing. Or at least I'm not getting some defiled text. You talk to a Jehovah's Witness or you talk to a Mormon, and they will tell you on, the, on your porch that your Bible is wrong. Your Bible is wrong. Uh, we have the real Bible. And then you'll say back to them, uh-uh, my Bible's right, your Bible's wrong. And that doesn't, that's not very convincing, right? That's a bad argument, right? Just throw it back at But when you start reading about where the text comes from and where our text comes from, you can have very good confidence that the text that we read is the same text as was written by Moses. You know, I don't know how many, what was it, 3,000, 4,000? How old? He's a long time ago. Oh, this is awesome. What if I don't want to see in a room and sing? For eternity in heaven. What do you think heaven's going to be like? Such a good question. <laughs> so good. We all got something to you say. want to take it? I hate, I, there's no way I'm going to heaven and sitting in a stupid room with a heart for I, eternity. That is just like, oh, no, why? And, and the thing is, I don't know where this idea came from, but it's total crap. It's not. You, won't, you don't see any of it in the Bible. None. That, that doesn't exist. That, that's not what you're doing in heaven. Will you be worshiping God? Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Will you enjoy it? Yes. Absolutely. 100%. Yes, you will enjoy it. But like, for example, um, Jesus is dying on the cross. Criminal to his left says, you know, he, the one criminal is like, dude, if you're God, you know, take us all down. Save us and yourself, you know. And the other guy's like, Man, come on, relax. Like, we robbed people. This man did nothing. We deserve to be up here. He doesn't, you know. And he goes, Lord, remember me when you go, when you go into your kingdom. That's what he says. I love that. It's amazing. And Jesus turns to this guy and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. And it's like, oh, it's really touching Jesus. It's really awesome. The word paradise is Persian. It means walled garden. It's a king's walled garden. That's heaven is going to be, in my opinion, I don't know, I haven't been there, and I only have the Bible to interpret, but heaven's going to be a paradise. It's going to be a remade, in my opinion, remade Eden. Right. He's going to remake heaven and earth, and it's going to be the way it was supposed to be all along. I mean, have you guys ever gone hiking someplace really cool? I mean, have you ever been to, like, maybe the Grand Canyon, or maybe Yosemite, or, I mean, there's a zillion places you can go where the world is absolutely, fantastically gorgeous. It's going to be like that to 11. It's going to be absolutely nuts. And, and you, you read Revelation, and you're like, man, they made streets of gold. That's kind of tacky, God. And like all these like weird, precious stones for foundations. <laughs> okay, that's like the 60s. It's stupid. Like, and so it really just seems awful. Right, but the thing is, John, right? John goes there, the rep- and he's like, "Whoa!" <laughs> I don't know, I'm like, and like they stung a hot coal in his mouth, and he doesn't know what's going on half the time. Like John was really confused. I have a feeling that he was just like, "I'm just trying to get through this and write this time at the same time." This is crazy. <laughs> so literally, like Revelation, don't read that and think you're like, "I know, what, I know what heaven's like," because you don't. Neither did he. He left it. He's like, "I have no idea what I just saw," you know, because when he saw Jesus. Jesus comes to him, and his feet are glowing bronze, and then a sword came out of his mouth. I was like, what? <laughs> Jesus, you really changed. <laughs> That's like a really, I'm not sure for the better. Like, so clearly John is trying to use some symbolism here in Revelation. And it's going to be sick amazing. It's going to be awesome, and it's not going to be 
I couldn't agree more. I'm super passionate about this too. The Christian faith, uh, I don't know where we came up with this idea. If you read God's word, it is so vibrant with this. The kingdom of God, think about it. God doesn't make mistakes, right? Edenic man was given Edenic paradise. There's no redos with God. We're the ones that messed it up, right? God, didn't, God doesn't do redos. So he's returning us to a vibrant life in a, in, a, in a kingdom that is made perfect. Think about it. I even think we have physical bodies. I think, because God likes physical things. He creates with physical things. And the things that limit us now, like I'm a musician, so I cannot wait to hear music in heaven. I just can't even wait. And he's right about John. John is using a human lexicon to describe what a human being cannot describe. So when you read that, he's just coming up with things. In fact, it reads like this. It's kind of like, yeah. it's kind of like this, but not really like that because I've never seen anything like that, right? I've seen a tree. I, I don't think we've seen a tree. I don't think we've seen an animal. I don't think we've seen things. But one more thing. If it, 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 it embolds and empowers our faith to think about this. You, we have a Father who loves us, so we will be able to communicate with each other without inhibition. Without somebody, we're, what are we doing? We're hedging our bets. We're looking at their eyes. Could they hurt me? I'm not going to tell them my deep secrets. So on and so forth. That'll be gone. Love will be pure. Your, your ability will not be hindered by time or gravity. Your creativity will not be hindered. It's an amazing thing. Heaven is life as God intended it to be. Uh, we're only seeing glimmers and flickers. And when you have a favorite band, they're nothing compared to what's going to get thrown down in heaven. It's, it's exciting. Thank <laughs> you.